The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Zurich Australia Limited, ABN 92000 010 195 AFSL 232 510 and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hi, I'm Andrew Rocks from Ensemble, and I'm thrilled to be bringing to you uh, the podcast Engine Room that's devoted entirely to the practices or the business of the business of financial advice. Over the course of the next many months, we're going to be interviewing Australia's best independent boutique advice firms, their practice managers, their GMs, on what environment is conducive to being a best practice how they keep talent, how they attract talent, and what the future of financial advice is. It's the Engine Room Podcast. Welcome aboard. Zurich is proud to be supporting this episode. The Zurich and OnePath Advisor portal is more efficient than ever before, giving you access to two leading brands with three highly sought-after products, underpinned by two powerful underwriting engines, all with one simple sign-on, making it easier for you to do business and perform at your best. Hi, welcome to another edition of the Engine Room Unpacked with a twist today. So today I'm joined at the mic, um, with Matt Brown and Neil Younger. It's a dynamic duo. It's Friday afternoon, so strap yourselves in. There's a promise of a lot of pretty de- pretty bad dad jokes, <laughs> um, but more importantly, a lot of really, really interesting and uh, very contemporary news. But before we get into all of that, um, as is um, what we love doing here at, at on- Ensemble, is just learning a bit about the people who guide this industry and the people that are part of turning it into a wonderful profession. One of those people with me is Matt Brown. So, Matt, what uh, how did you get to where you are today? Hey, Roxy. Uh, may I, ha- how long have you got? I'm, I'm an old man these days. I've been around. Hang on. I'm still scrolling your LinkedIn history. <laughs> it will be a while, and I've got a super fast computer. Yeah. Oh, look, I, I hate to admit this because not too many people like that profession, but I actually started straight out of uni in the law profession, Um my very first job was in a legal firm, and I worked out that wasn't for me. Um, and because uh, you did the masters of uh, a financial law, is that right? Yeah, exactly right. We got never never been a lawyer, can't practice a lawyer, uh, not a law degree, but yeah, master of law. I but, tried doing that as well, and um, back at uni, it sort of crept into my touch football and, and going out time, so I decided to <laughs> give it a miss. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, sort of similar. Um, found out it wasn't for me, and and. Traverse then financial services, I and mean, I've done a lot of things throughout the uh, industry from um, um, from technical insights uh, to I ran some cash funds, some old ADF um, cash funds back in the day when rollover funds were, were common. Um, were, were, were you running said cash funds around the GSC? No, way before that. It was, okay, uh, okay. Into the into the early two thousands, late nineties. I did some insurance underwriting, so I've been a um, life insurance underwriter for a few years, um, so I know what, what that world is a bit like. Uh, and I uh, stumbled across, really, financial advice, and I, I got my first opportunity to work directly with financial advice in a licensee back in the financial wisdom days, when way back when they were owned by the Commonwealth Bank. And yep. um, in my very second week, actually, in that job, I met a young man named Paul Barrett, and we together cut our teeth and understanding who advisors were and how small practice ran and in, in the context of advice because I'd come from a legal small practice. So I knew what it was like to have pressure that the, your clients rely on you or your staff rely on you uh, to put to put food on the table for everyone. So understanding small business but understanding the nuances from financial planning, uh, I cut my teeth for a good couple of decades. And where it really resonated with me, uh, Roxy, and why I've chosen and, and stayed in it for such a long time, uh, it's quite a personal one. Um, my father-in-law um, uh, was a builder, chippy, uh, and a plasterer, and he he got mesothelioma. So, so uh, what is that? Um, you know, you, you know the Hardy um, as, um, asbestos yep. cases. Yeah, it's basically cancer of the lungs. Got it. It's, a, it's a bloody horrible, yeah, tragic, painful, long, drawn-out way to die. And he has a wife and three daughters, of whom I married his middle daughter, wow. and he knew I was roughly in this game of 
financial advising. And so I introduced him to a good mate of mine who's still financial planning up in um, John, up in up in Chatswood in Sydney. Um, and a long story short, we we put him and his wife through the financial planning process. Um, and he only had less than two months to live, and he was in the hospice. And the relief on his face to know that his girls would be looked after. His wife didn't have to work again. The girls had money. They they you can't buy that, right? You, that that relief and sense of pride and satisfaction that he got, mate. That that hooked me. And so for me, that just gave me passion to well, I could be an advisor or I could help facilitate lots of people doing it. And so the life of licensees um, post CBA, I met Neil when he was um, head of Commonwealth Financial Planning, and I was running some other licensees there, and then we together, well, separately, but ended up together later on in life at ANZ, and I ran Millennium 3 and Financial Services Partners there for nearly eight-odd years and met some wonderful people. And uh, I've, got to, I've got to interject there. So going back to that, that story, the Genesis story, um, your, your father-in-law. So at the you made you introduced the the, the financial planner, and um, they did things such as organising state affairs, all of those things. And at what age were you? So you were we were married, or were you were dating? I was married. Right. Uh, okay. I was in my. Uh, I was about forty, late okay. 30, late thirties, okay. forty. Yeah. Okay. It's just I always say it on this podcast. It's a pity. And for all the listeners who are financial advisors, we do love you, but it's a pity the general public doesn't listen to this. Right, it's just a pity that these stories aren't highlighted, um, and that is just something that money can't buy. Oh, hundred percent. And as as all financial planners know, uh, he's more than sorted out the financial affairs of that family. He was a counsellor uh, oh, for yeah. a dying, he's, he's dying couple of months. Right, yeah. that, that's just that's just special. So uh, I remember um, the cancer council um, has worked with the financial advice industry for so long, and there's countless great examples of of untold positive stories of along those lines. So I just thought I'd interject there because, you know, part of this positive evolution of financial advice is the big stakeholder is is the general public and oh, and, and and we we do good things. Mm-hmm. So so then then you've uh, you've then worked your way into the business of the business. So without necessarily ever being in financial advice, you've always Sort of assisted running financial planning practices effectively. Would that be right? Yeah, that's right. Counseling to um, and guidance to financial planning, how they run a good business. Yeah, um, and to run a good business, I learned pretty early that well, we all need a license, yes, but how do you how do you get a license just embeds into a practice so it's not a hindrance? And that's sort of we I learned that a long, long time ago. That was the key. Uh, how do you be a genuine business partner, not a policeman? Uh, and so that sort of flavoured. The way we've approached and the way I've thought about the various licenses that I've that I've run and led for the last couple of decades, and, and, uh, and I, I note you've um, when you took on the role at um, uh, Millennium Three, it, it, it looks along your timeline to be pretty well exactly when FOFA came out. Yeah, it was um, it was a pretty tumultuous time. Yeah, um, lots of change that, that, that scared a lot of people. And- yeah, so when you said counsellor, I picked up that earlier. It would have been, I mean, you were trying to have some confidence with the practices, but. Deep down, you probably didn't know what was next either. Well, you never admit that you don't know if exactly. Well, you can in retrospect. <laughs> That's one of these 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 stories. But but you know, an upper step. None of us exactly knew which way the wind was going to blow. No, look, look, yeah. lots of lots of good luck as well as as a, having a few educated punts on the way things would go. And the big thing for advisors back then was, particularly in Millennium Three, and you know, all the great people and the advisors I'd met in that neck were really highly skilled in. In, in specialist advice into the life insurance market, which was particularly being hammered at the time. Yeah. Um, and uh, helping them remain focused on what's important and let's not get distracted with the mudslinging um, and let's just navigate a way through it. So that was really important. Then I, I decided that that banks weren't for me. Um, and I met a great uh, guy who was the CEO of the wealth division at Australian Unity. Um, name's David Bryan. He's since moved on to, to Mercer and other places. Um, um, and they were... a and still are, but they're a mutual. They're a well-being organisation. They're 150 something years old. 182. Wow. Yeah, they've been around wow. a long time, right? And and, fin- and you're right. They so they're a, when you say well-being because I it was actually one of the people we're going to talk about later on. Ben Donald gave me the, the rundown of, of this organisation. But what what do you mean by that? So it gets to the heart of who they are, and it sounds a bit odd. Um, but Australian Unity. Um, they operate health insurance. They operate health property trusts. They are one of the biggest aged care providers. They're, they're aged care providing for my mother as we speak. Yeah, uh, you told us. Yeah, Roxy, and that's, mm. that's a difficult day when they transition into those, right? Yep. So they do all of those things, but that's not who they are. They're yep. a well-being organisation. So 
So financial advice to them was how do they help um, people with one of the most important aspects that gives people security, and that's their financial well-being and security. And so that's that was the remit that I was given within the Australian Unity Group, which was how do we take what was a decent little financial planning licensee. We had you know, 150 odd advisors, 140 or 50 advisors there at the time, um, and how do we embed that um, into more people's lives? And so we we grew it slowly. Um, it's difficult in an organisation sometimes to get all the capital you want when you're up against. I'd go to the board there and I'd say, look, I want to invest in this great initiative and it's going to do this for financial advisors and that's great and well and good. And then the bloke next to me is pitching for um, a few million bucks to build a phone counselling service for Beyond Blue that saves people from topping themselves. I mean, it's... Especially when you're voting for him. Yeah, 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 I'm, <laughs> yeah I'm hands up, mate. I'm, I'm with you, brother. So... Yeah, that, um, that was that was a really fulfilling um, yet frustrating time as well, but really fulfilling. But it gave me a fresh perspective and made me feel good about who we were. And but we were having challenges as a licensee. There was so much we wanted to do. We didn't quite ever have the capacity in the headspace to get done what I wanted to do. And it was obvious to me for a while that finding a way that we could innovate and be different. Um, how could we fulfil our ambitions to to be a great business partner and a services group to more people and um, yeah, and, and I know a lot of... But roughly, because because I've got Neil uh, with, with me here as well. We're going to hear from Neil in a second. But clearly, there must have been a moment, your first date. We're going to get to that in a minute. But at what stage? You mentioned the frustrations. You've been, you, you've, you've been sort of running businesses like this for a long time. Yeah. You obviously wanted to do better for those practices. And, 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 and is that what drew you to... Um, to, to Neil, ultimately? Well, what 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 drew me... Jeez, oh, that's a horrible sense because, you know, he's got a head like a beaten crab, but... We're not editing that out, <laughs> just, just to be clear. Yeah, <laughs> good, okay. <laughs> um, but what, what, what yeah. opened the conversation was I've known Neil a long time yep. um, uh, from our days back when we first met um, at Colonial First Aid and, and Combat and then through through ANZ, but oh, I'm a simple man, uh, Roxy. I, I, I just, just go with what you trust. Um, and I've dealt in uh, both professionally and you know, across the industry doing advocacy work in Canberra and stuff for many years alongside Neil, and I've never known him not to not to meet a promise. He's never broken a promise. And so when we started to think about what the challenges were with PFS and scale and, and, and getting things done, and we've got all these ambitions, and lo and behold, when you're on the road a lot and you're, you're crossing paths a lot, you're you, you hear each other's stories, and, and Neil had Fortnum um, under his wing, which is a wonderful business, a bit bigger than we were at PFS, but with similar frustrations um, or, and ambitions. And so it just felt like a natural thing to turn that over a beer or two into maybe there's something we should do here. And um, when, did, when did it all come together? So you've had a beer or two in Canberra, which you pretty well need every time you go to Canberra. Shout out to all of our Canberra planners. They'll be exiting at about 13 minutes. Um, <laughs> So it's all good and well to have a concept, but you still had a 180-year-old institution behind you. How did you break the news to them? Um, well, actually, the, so off our conversations, more credit to, to, to Neil and, and Paul Barrett, actually, because we, we left conversations, there's something we can do. Um, Neil's a bit of a nerd. He went and did his homework, and, and he actually approached um, Australian Unity and said, look, we think your business is great, and it thinks it looks like this, and it wasn't an approach which said we want to buy you. It was an approach which said, how can we invest in something new together? How can we be innovative and different? And, and that was the conversation that Neil um, came to myself and eventually to, to my boss, Esther, and to the AU board. Um, and that that evolved from how do we do something together to Australian Unity saying, well, we actually think we might slow you down and there's actually a path here that we can support. So we're still in bed with us, Australian Unity. We've got an alliance agreement and partnership with them. But they handed ownership across to uh, over to Fortnum um, because they knew that we could do it faster, better. And look, we're going we're to uh, highlight a couple of practices um, from from uh, Australian Unity, and and I know them all very well, having interviewed them and um, uh, early doors. But they're all pretty happy with with the lack of friction and and what's happened. And and with so many roles where you're looking after lots of people, yeah. um, what do you do to unwind? Oh, I um. Uh, I, I'm a mad sport. I just love sport. Whether I play, exercise, all my kids play multiple sports a weekend. So I'm a I'm a professional Uber driver on the weekend and, and sports um, supporter. Watching my kids, um, that's that's basically it. And, and I'm a nerd, so I read a lot. 
We've got the Olympics as well, so you're, you, you, if you're not watching, you're overnight watching at the moment as well. So. Yeah, exactly, and there's a fair bit to watch, isn't there? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, what was your favourite sport again, Roxy? What were you liking to watch? Out I was watching the basketball. Um, yeah. I was watching the basketball at the Olympics. Uh, it's, it's a great sport. Uh, uh, stay in sport. Uh, stay in sport, kids, as long as you can. It's good for you. Absolutely. Um, and um, your partner in, in oh, I can't say crime, but your partner in celebration today, uh, Neil Younger, um, welcome to the mic. Thank you. Um, I've had a bit of a, a look, and if, if, if Matt said he's been doing this for decades, which he dropped a few times, um, I've ca- tried to carbon date your genesis in, in, in this year, but um, yeah, I get the what is it, the Arab syntax error or something like that. But um, it all started back at uh, Griffith University, is that right? Yeah, yeah. That's uh, so. My uni days were all at uh, at uh, Griffith, and economics was my uh, chosen uh, pursuit. Funny when you do economics as a degree, you sort of. Uh, you know, you convince yourself you're going to be an economist. And uh, when I finished my economics degree, it was the last thing I wanted to ever be. I did a Bachelor uh, of Economics and uh, basically, you know, three or four years of theory. Yeah. And you get out and, and it's like, how do you write a check? But, but, <laughs> but, but Roxy, it's a science, right? So Of course, of course. And of course. So, so I called myself a scientist for a while. Yep. And, and yep. Oh, that sorry, was, God. That was pretty cool. Yep. <laughs> and um, so what did you end up doing? So you, you, you obviously didn't get the job you coveted as the Reserve Bank Governor. So I did really well in my economics degree. For some reason, I, I I I did okay at it, and I got some offers to go to Canberra, work for the Reserve Bank, and I still remember contemplating that. And two things challenged me because I'm a Queenslander, right? So yeah. to go somewhere cold like Canberra was, you know, purpose for cold is skiing and not a lot else. Going to Canberra was and certainly not on my things to do list. Uh, and I'm, and like all people that you know, young and you, you need to get a job. Back in the day, and whilst you suggested there was a long day ago, it wasn't that long ago, I, I thought, well, you know, who am I going to work for? And I found myself, would you believe, and there's an irony to this, found myself applying for and getting a job at AMP. So that was, and I say it's an irony because obviously, you know, most recently we've done a deal with AMP to buy their advisory businesses, but that was my first job. And uh, funny enough- Do you still have a business? Did you get the job? I did you, get the job. You did. Do you still have the business card? Because, geez, I'd love to have that. No, no I don't have the business card. Oh. I, started, I started in this clerical department in AMP, right? Because they sort of sent you as graduates through these various parts yeah. of the business. And I remember my first day, the HR manager takes me down in the lift and drops me off at the floor where where the business was that I was going to work. It was called Life Service Department. Um, he abbreviated to LSD and said something like, you need a drug to work here. <laughs> so that was my first entree. Back in the day, the other thing he, words of wisdom he left with me is, Neil, we don't uh, just give you a job. We give you a career for life. And uh, you know what? He was right because I've stayed in financial services for my whole career, not always with AMP. Well, it's a bit of a boomerang. It is a bit of a boomerang. Well, I haven't gone back to AMP, but AMP's certainly come our way, which is, you know, well, it's fantastic. But yeah, that was my, my start to, uh, to life in financial services. But my real start in the advice part was also with AMP because AMP one of the first groups to really sort of push this transition from kind of the agency model advisor structure into, uh, into the authorised rep structure and under the licences. Where did you put that down? Is that early noughties? Yeah, it was actually in the late nineties. Was it? Yeah, yeah. Because I left AMP at the end of uh, ninety nine. Because they were dealer groups yeah. before then, weren't they? They, they yeah, were, and they... and they were sort of different structure. And you still, particularly in the AMP world, and National Mutual would have been somewhat similar. Uh, those businesses had more the agency style structure, and obviously people were changing from being an agent to being a financial advisor. They're putting a new shingle on the wall. That's right. And for all those people that might be a bit newer to the industry in the last ten years. The agency thing inferred who you acted for. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it was quite, was quite, uh, very much you acted for the insurance company, um, even though, and in retrospect, it's di- 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 completely opposed to, to how you conducted yourself in front of the clients. And, and um, yeah, so um, good riddance to that, I, I yeah. imagine. Well, it was the right thing to evolve away from, right? Yeah. So, and so I cut my teeth on working with a lot of, what were then agents, but really just the fledgling start of financial planning businesses and what that would look like in a different model. And and I loved it. I thought it was, you know, a fantastic opportunity. And whilst I probably don't have the same personal stories that Matt has, I've had the opportunity to hear plenty of them over my time in this advice sector. And, you know, you, you, 
if you don't believe in advice, you've got to ask yourself the question what you're doing anywhere near an advice business. And I certainly believe in its value and I've seen it in plenty of, plenty of people's lives. So it seemed like a pretty worthwhile career to be a part of. So, you know, Queensland was- well, Why? Well, for that, for that reason, yeah. because it makes a difference. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it, it helps people. Like- yeah. And I think it's the, the intangible piece that uh, Matt referred to that's far more critical is, you know, that peace of mind uh, that, that people that have got their things sorted in whatever stage of their life, whether their plans for the future or their plans for, for, uh, for, for their family, I think it's critical. And, you know, that, that has an intrinsic value. And, and people that haven't necessarily had the opportunity to work with financial planners, the unfortunate thing is they don't understand that. They think it's often just a, you know, a transaction where I'll go and invest some money. Well, no, it's, you invest money for a purpose. If you can get to that conversation around purpose, that's a lot more of a, you know, a driving, motivating and fulfilling way to, 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 to live life. So, you know, I like financial advice. So I like financial advisors and, uh, I like the business model that sat around it. Uh, did you I, always like the licensee model? Well, I think the thing that I liked was, you know, the, the structure of the business as it was then was about enabling financial advisory businesses to get better. So I really like that practice. So enabling to get better. Love yeah. that. Love that. That's, that's very much at the core of what yeah. you're trying to do. Great. And at some stage, there were probably headwinds and it feels a bit like it's getting back to the original premise. Oh, I think that's exactly where we've got to now. You know, I think we, I don't say we lost our way, but we had a lot of other things to take care of. Uh, and I think for a long part of certainly my career in financial advice, businesses, licensee businesses were inside institutions. Institutions had different objectives, not always aligned with that of a financial advisory business. And, and that made things tough. And then, of course, because we deal with people's life savings and their money, uh, you know, it's a heavily regulated environment. And when things go wrong, it becomes even more regulated to try and resolve those issues from occurring again. And that, I think, has been a very challenging process for many advisors to have to sort of undertake over a long period of time. I, I think, you know, as things have now progressed, as institutions have said, well, maybe Australian Unity was this, maybe we're not the right place for these businesses to sit. We see them as really valuable, but we should work with them in an area that they're better suited to serve their clients and to invest appropriately and to grow. Uh, I think we're in a better place for that. And uh, and now, of course, we've seen decisions made by the last two of the real uh, sizable institutional parties to put these businesses in a different business model that makes more sense. Well, they've separated church and state finally. Correct. Yeah. You know, so I, I look here that you've been um, uh, you've been running Fortnum for near on eight years. Yeah. And um, I imagine the premise and, 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 and what you laid down as the culture um, hasn't changed, but um, over that, that period of time, but what's happening now is that that culture and that premise is what people want to gravitate to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, as we've insinuated uh, already on the call, it's a big, a big uh, congratulations for almost everyone listening. Um, AMP has been has touched um, uh, advisors, um, whether they went through the Horizons Academy, whether they've invested in them, whatever they've done. It's, it's it is a, a household name. It's one hundred and fifty here. One hundred seventy five. One hundred seventy five years, years that old. Something yesterday where they was they were pulling out the birthday cake. One hundred seventy five years. There you go. And 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 and, and, and as of uh, as of today's um. Uh, recording um, the the business was uh, the advisory business is 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 moving into the new co, which I'd love you to talk about. Yeah, so for I'll probably get there. I'll, I'll just sort of talk a little bit about the philosophy of why, and then we'll talk a little bit about you know where this fits. You know the the whole premises of both Fortnum and and now of course rebranded in entirety is is to be a business services company for financial advisory practices. That's its whole ethos. And um, Matt said something about being simple before, but uh, you know, to try and keep things simple so you can get it, um, the reality of what we do every day is is to try to find a way to make access to financial advice for clients uh, easier. And we try to find a way to make the their buying power, if you like, or their purchasing power of, of advice solutions you know, more efficient. So you're really thinking so, it in the end goal, the, yeah, the consumer. And yeah. well, why else would we be in the game? Yeah, yeah. Solve it for them is yeah. where you start. Well, they're our employers. 
Correct. Because uh, where, where does the, the clearinghouse, right? So, Correct. So, yeah, which is, um, you know, that's yet again, that's at the other end of the spectrum of yeah. what was the, the, the thought pattern. Yeah, I think what we've done is reverse the value chain, right? Start with the uh, the client and then think about what are the things that are necessary for everybody that sits up the value chain to do the best thing possible for the client. So the person that sits closest to the client is the financial advisor. So that's got to figure in our thinking as well. So how do we... How do we help the financial advisor or the financial advisory practice to do things better, faster, and more economically viable? So that's that's essentially the whole premise of the business model. And I'll, now, I'll, 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 I'll put a question to you. You don't have to answer now, but economic viability is the elephant in the room with, with licensees. Yeah. And we've seen um, licensees such as your own um, moving forward and, and doing exciting things. And we've seen other licensees... Um, and moving sideways or moving out of yeah. it. What do you see as the two or three sort of guiding principles to bring them into profitability? I think having the right construct and the right reason for doing it. Um, I'll let Neil talk more about the economics since he's a, a doctor of economics now we've just let. Uh, and not a doctor. But the thing that, the thing that Fortnum um, 20 years ago or 12, 20 years ago that it started by the, the wonderful Ray Miles, yeah. um, it was – based off the premise of being owned and run by advisors and management. So it's owned. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, and as we've created the PFS and Fortnum businesses come together and created entirety, bringing those collectives together, that fundamental premise is still critical. So if we're in this genuinely together and our advisors have the opportunity to take a part of that organisation and we choose together where we place our bets what support they need, where is the business going. Our job is to foster and have the smarts of how to do that. And and, and the economics um, don't work when you're in an institution, but they do work when you're in an organisation like ours. Oh, here's the reality. They didn't need to work in an institution because they were effectively distribution models for product. So it was very easy in that environment to to run the businesses losing money uh, for the purpose of of another part of the business. And uh, that created, I think, an artificially low view of the value associated with the services available from licenses because they didn't have to pay much for them. Um, and clearly when there was a separation, as you referred to it, church and state, you needed to move to a, a more sustainable model. And I think that's, that's the journey that the post-institutional era has then put on the sector. And that meant that prices had to go up because the cost of the services were, were high. Uh, they're, they're way too high. They're, they're, they're too high in advisory practices in terms of productivity around advice, and they're too high in licensee businesses in terms of the supervision functions and the things that we have to do. Especially against every um, you know consumer survey of what they're willing to pay. Co- correct. It's, it's, it's a cavernous gap. The only thing, though, is, is that I think people are willing to pay as we see this as a proof point every day for good quality financial advice, right? But we need to find better ways to deliver the types of advice people want at different price points. And that's, that's, exactly that's right. where we're sort of struggling. Exactly. Well, where the industry has struggled, probably because of the regulatory framework we all run in, right? So, And before the, the recording today, um, uh, and given that you did the transaction less than 24 hours ago, I said, what are you doing later on? You said sleeping. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, I'd like to know, uh, question to yourself, Neil, what, what do you do outside of uh, work? Because, you know, running people is a nightmare sometimes. You can have its, <laughs> it can have its good times and the good times can be where everyone's patting you on the back as you've probably got the last 24 hours, but it can be deep and dark, especially when people get scared and advice practices don't know what's going on. Yeah. What do you do to unwind? Oh, like I'm, I'm a sports guy too. So I like spending, you know, plenty of time outdoors and plenty of time, uh, you know, doing some exercise. So we heard it. Yeah. Are you challenging each other to some sort of uh, decathlon style you, sporting competition? Do you want to have an arm it? wrestle or something, Matt? Or oh, we could do the arm wrestle, Neil. Yeah. But that's about the only feature you've got is your guns. Uh, <laughs> let, if we did an, uh, a bit an arm wrestle into a run, we could do that. I reckon I'll win the run though. Okay. That's, okay. You're a bit short, so I'm not sure that'll work necessarily. But there you go. Uh, so yeah, I'll do a lot of that, and you know what? As uh, I've I've taken up camping. Okay, it's, that is kind of a, a really weird thing to say, but um, well, it was that because? Can I ask you? Is is the bit that you like being outside a range of mobile phones? Oh, a little bit like that, but also you know what camping is for me? It's uh, it takes everything away because 
when you go camping, for whatever reason, you're almost given permission to do nothing for a long period of time. Now, I don't like to sit around idly, but just making some food, you can sit there for an hour and do something, whereas in normal life, you've got to do it with pace to get it done, move on to the next thing. Light, I like it. Like, have good lighting a yeah. fire and sitting around it. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's fun. Particularly with a good red wine, I'm a bit partial to that. So, um, so yeah, I like uh, I like the outdoor stuff. And if I we like, could just um, get the links to the BCFing fun site, yeah. uh, uh, Kieran the Sound Guy. I'm, sp- I'm sponsored by Anaconda. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Actually, I think I've been sponsoring Anaconda. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think it goes the other way. I think yeah, you're fine. But right. uh, and um, tell me about. The, so, so Matt, thank you for giving me a bit of an overview of what drove uh, the business, which is called Entirety, and mm-hmm. and and you in, and you got involved in that. That's still a fresh concept. Yeah. I feel like that's three six months old maximum. Yeah, yeah, um, spot on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so here you are dating Neil, and then Neil's sort of you've ended up. He's proposed. You, you guys have you, you've, you've moved in together, and Neil's seen someone else at the same time. And all of a sudden, <laughs> uh, all of a sudden, you've you've got an unusual relationship where, which I believe personally, and on behalf of the engine room, and having met with and spoken with a lot of the practices at AMP Hillross and Charter over my time, I think is a personally is a great outcome for them. So um, tell you. us the genesis of of how that started. Uh so. So that started um, really with AMP. I think AMP have been, you know, considering what is the best path for that licensee business, uh, how they best place to, you know, continue to be not just relevant but help advisors achieve what they're looking to do. And you know, that questioning them was it right inside the AMP or was it right outside? So they uh, they commenced uh, yeah, a, a process to understand what that option might look like and. Uh, we participated in that process with a view that you know, we thought we had the the makeup or the model to a system to do what they needed to do, and uh, that prevailed. So, of course, then you go through very detailed contracts and negotiations, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, fresh off the press, we finished that only only really Thursday morning. I'm going to say morning, the day before the – obviously, the morning before the announcements. Uh, so – you know, it's been a uh, it's been a intense period of time, but I think what's really pleasing from my perspective is that there's such alignment between the things that we think about are important in business like entirety. So that client focus: can we get a better outcome for clients? Can we get a better outcome for businesses and their own profitability? Uh, and that's that's the journey that AMP are on in terms of what they want to be able to do with their advisory clients as well. And I think that's uh, that makes us a perfect match. That's right. And look, for everyone who's in, in, in the AMP network at the moment, uh, the AMP of today is a completely different business. You know, they're all, they're all on triple A's. They're all fee for service. They're all corporately minded. Um, they're all utilizing best practices, great investment strategies, et cetera. So, um, I think that there is quite an alignment. Yeah. Um, there. And, um, the, I suppose the other question I had was, um, and let's do a bit of myth busting mm-hmm. because um, uh, part of the transaction had to do with AZNGA and sometimes people get confused whether AZNGA, you know, what their level of involvement is with your business, how, yeah. how it works. And I suppose that's because people just get excited, right? Yeah. Um, and it'd be great to know, you know, where they fit in to, to your business and, and, and how you view each other operationally. Yeah. So- I would classify our relationship, and, and it's a close one, as a strategic partnership. And and the reason that I say that- So is, no equity ownership at all? No, no cross ownership. Great. Uh, the entirety business is uh, owned by advisors and staff of the business. So uh, in that sense, there's no ownership by AZNGA uh, in the entirety group. Uh, but we do a lot of stuff together. Absolutely, right? and and a lot of so, a lot of the practices have made their way there for their free choice. Yeah. So you know, what do we specialise in? We specialise in obviously the licensing services part, but we got a few more strings to our bow, and that's why we rebranded it the headline entirety because it means completeness, and we think that there's an opportunity to offer a complete set of services to advice businesses. Now that's where we have some parallels with AZNGA who invest in those advice businesses, they buy them and they work with them to get better. Well, we have a lot of enablement capability to assist those same businesses and that's where we run parallel. So we provide you know, a lot of licensing services and a lot of additional capabilities in through the entirety structure to the AZ uh, businesses. And then, of course, 
uh, things like uh, AU who were were looking at how do we manage a set of salaried employee staff. Yeah, it's a and good symbiotic relationship between solving two problems with one right, stro- with, stroke with, of the brush. With one, with one partnership yeah. solution that we could bring yeah. to bear and we could help them on the licensing side and, and solve that at the same time. Uh, similar story with AMP. So, look, it's early doors. I just wanted to get that one over and done with because uh, uh, it's, it's, it's tectonic, I, w- I would have to say. Um, but what I'd like to now just pivot and focus on is um, when we started chatting a couple of uh, months ago, um, I, I was actually – shout out to Aaron Zoll, who's, uh, um, uh, who's put, put this together – he sort of said, Roxy, you always like highlight good quality practices. And in fact, some of my practices have been on your program and they really like it. And But the, the licensee is good as well. And I'm like, no one cares. Like, honestly. <laughs> and I said, what do you oh, mean? Ouch. And, and, he, and he, said, he said, yeah, they do. I said, no, I'll take that back. And then I started thinking philosophically that Ensemble is all about the positive evolution of financial advice, which... The genesis of that was the positive evolution of the financial advisor, and then we've pivoted into the fi- positive evolution of the financial advice practice, which incorporates the para planning that the practice managers, etc. And the last link in the puzzle was the actual glue that binds it together, which is the licensee. So, with 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 sort of you're not late to the party, but I believe now that that everyone's shoulder is going to be to the wheel, pushing the same way. I think that that unraveling. So what I wanted to, uh, I suppose, right, you, you're nodding, by the way. It doesn't translate. doesn't oh, translate for, uh, for yes. podcasts. <laughs> so um, what I wanted to, to focus on is that, you know, I've interviewed some cracking practices. And I think from memory, a, a couple of the ones that you were involved with, Matt, previously and a couple of uh, in, in your stable, um, I'd, I'd love to um, maybe run through who they are um, and we can get a bit of a feel for, you know, why do you think they, they came with you and, and – why do you think they stay? And, and more importantly, what do you think you guys can do to make them better? How's yep. that sound? Spot on. Okay, let's do it. So, yeah, the practices we're, we're talking about today, um, and I had I had fun recording these. So, uh, first practice was um, Ozbroker's Life with uh, with Ben Donald Chiang. Um, great business, a really big uh, life insurance uh, speciality. Um, the next business was um, Avondale out there at Parramatta, um, which is a, an overall business and a bit of a story um, which a lot of people listening to this will be familiar with of a very good quality advisor who was in the bank system, the private wealth system, that has made the step from that out to their own practice and why they chose you. Um, the Nestworth business, which, uh, to be honest, uh, Matt, they, they actually were part of the equation um, recently when they acquired the um, – the B two C part of Australian Unity, is that yeah, correct? they did. Yeah, they were yeah, just, when we had our business at Australian Unity. Yeah, we had we employed twenty advisors and, and a great business with all the CSOs yeah. and Nestworth. Um, yeah, took that um, yeah. and and fostering a really cool business. Yeah, and I had a great chat with Ian, so it was good. And um, finally, I, I chatted with uh, Jake Roos um, from Bob Roos and Co. And um, promptly then went out um, for two drinks, which turned into ten. So Jake, um, that's, that's like on Jake. you. Yeah. So it sounds like Jake. So. So, yeah, maybe um, I'll flick over to you, yourself, uh, Neil. You've got a yeah. couple of practices up there on the board behind me. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you think? And, th- and by the way, maybe give a bit of an overview of, of what you think they are because they're four completely different practices. Would that be yeah. fair to say? Yeah, yeah, I reckon that's the best observation, um, Roxy, because I would suggest, and this is one of the challenges that, that we've dealt with together, Neil, for in each of our lives, respective careers for the best part of a couple of decades is in two, in that time, I've never seen the one right business model, Roxy. I've never seen a business model um, that is better than the other. So you could have a specialist business model, whether it be in life insurance or self-managed fund. You could have a GP. You could have a high net worth, wholesale, sophisticated investor business or a higher volume, whatever it is, or if it's geographically located. But you know the one thing we've learned? What's that? Every one of those businesses that are successful have a few things. One, they define their own success. They know what they want to achieve. But the elements that drive their success, no matter what their business model, are the same. It's being really clear about having the right number of the right clients, your productivity and efficiency, so building capacity, and managing risk so you don't blow up. Now, I said it again, I said it earlier, I'm a simple guy, but it actually makes our life really clear. 
because no matter what business model, whether it be an Ospreakers or a Bob Bruce or a Nestworth or an Avondale, they're very, very different. But the factors that drive their success are going to be the same. Well, let's kick off with um, let's kick off with Ausbrokers. Um, they uh, they are out and out um, life insurance specialists, and um, I have a lot of time for for, for Ben and Shan. And um, uh, not only do they uh, specialise, but they quite often get referrals from other financial planners, which is a which is a a, a, a great development within our industry. Mm. It, it reminds me more of the medical industry, where a GP will refer out for a particular job, yeah. which is which is good, right? It's yeah, great. Spot on. Um, and uh, so their clarity is is pretty pretty obvious. Um, uh, it's in their name. <laughs> yeah. So um, I've just got a quote um, from those guys, which sums up kind of uh, what I feel um, is where they are in the marketplace. So can you focus through that quote? Osbroke is, uh, is part of a publicly listed entity called the AUB Group. Uh, their market cap, I think, is about $2 billion or so. But Ausbrokers, as a, as I guess the sub sub branch or the or the subset of AUB, they largely a general insurance brokerage. There's about fifty or thereabouts independent firms throughout the country, uh, and they all have various niches. So, you know, there's a team in uh, Wagga that operate on a geography specialist. There's quite a few teams in Sydney that uh, specialize in industry. So, for example, Ausbrokers Aviation. You know, the bulk of their clients are, are helicopter operator, operators. Um, Trade Credit just does Trade Credit. Um, there's Cruden and Reed just does construction, but by and large, there's if there's a risk in Australia related to general insurance, Ausbrokers can manage it. And I guess where the Ausbrokers life came from was the the public entity or the, or the larger um, group understanding that risk management didn't just extend to the chair, but also the person in it. And that's where I guess Ausbrokers life comes from is, is you want to make sure that you're doing everything you can from the client. Um, and it's just a natural extension from a general insurance conversation. As part of their structure, right, when you when you consolidate, you realize that you can achieve some greater efficiencies. And one of those areas that we found was with a, a direct claims manager. Now, there aren't many businesses around the country that have a claims manager. And I guess the, the return on, on um, uh, I guess, employing that person has been absolutely monstrous. Um, so Paul Langdale was an advisor for 20 odd years. And uh, when when we bought the business that he was a part of, uh, he was really proud to have this big certificate from one path that I think talked about at the time 6.4 million or 10.4 million worth of claims. We'll just say 10.4, make it up. Um, but uh, the, the natural progression for him as an advisor was that he, he found the most joy in engaging with clients and insurers to make sure that the right outcome was achieved. So Paul's been integral to the team. Uh, he, he works with all of us. Now, some of our advisors choose to take a front foot with a lot of claims and have Paul do all basically the legwork in the background. Uh, and other advisors are just happy to sort of handball it straight to him. So Paul at any one stage is dealing with between 90 and 100 claims. Oh, my God. Um, yeah, we, we had a massive spike on that in, in uh, with COVID and mental health claims, unsurprisingly. Um, but the last financial year, I think we did 37 million in claims. And this financial year, I know we're two days out still, but uh, we're tracking to finish at about $26 million worth of claims out to clients. Hundred percent, and and yep. what is it mainly? You've got a back book, or, or what's what's the size of the business? No, so we have uh, about fifty million in, in premium, um, and that's across sort of. I guess our our book, because we made about ten purchases over the last five years. It's quite of um, quite an amalgamation of different demographics, different geographies, all that sort of thing, because it's reflective of the Ausbrokers Group. But uh, each year, I think this financial year, we're aiming for three million in new business premium. Um, and it's just it's just really enjoyable, hey. So we've got really good, strong relationships with the insurers, and we're able to leverage that on claims, on new business outcomes, uh, and all our advisors can you know split their time between managing the renewal book with a, a very schmick process in the background, uh, looking at the new business process, which I'm sure Sean will talk about um, how we get advice out to clients, and and if they choose to uh, taking a heavier part of the claims process. So our support teams start as soon as the advisor meets with the client. So effectively, they may know prior to the meeting. If they don't, they'll know as soon as the meeting's over. They're introduced straight away, so they're always a second set of hands to catch them if they have any questions or need to go from there. And then the support team just ensure the entire process runs smoothly. We've got all A's across the business with our audits this year, so everyone's doing what they're supposed to do with a really robust, solid system that runs behind them. So, Matt, I'm going to throw to you. Um, you've just heard a bit of a, a soundbite um, uh, from the Ausbrokers uh, Life team. Um, your two other points around capacity and risk management, how do you think they apply 
um, to this practice. They're probably the best in the business that I've seen about being um, really clear about what works and what doesn't. So building capacity for them has become around efficiency, being really clean on process. We're using technology to to do the mundane, but focusing on um, um, yeah, just the process and allocating the right people doing the right job at the right time. Um, and they're fastidious about getting it right, crossing every T and dotting every I. And when you're writing thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollar premium cases where there's a lot that can go wrong, that that's critical. Um, so they've got it really right, um, and they've learned how not only to be efficient within their practice, but how do they engage efficiently? So with the insurers, how do they get the decision more efficiently than yeah. anyone else? How do they get to that right bit, um, at the right place for their client really quickly? And um, how do you think they're managing risk? And I'll put it back on you. With the new cow entirety, what are you guys going to bring to the table to for this sort of a practice? Um, with the they're managing risk because they, they, their attention to detail is exemplary. Um, well, to be clear, that's not Ben. That's Sean, right? Of course. Yeah, I'm Ben's mate, right? So, so Sean, yes. Yeah, we all know Sean's yeah, the brains yeah. of the okay. operation and Brent's cool. not even the pretty one out the front. Cool, cool, cool. Because they're across the road. I just had a red laser dot on my forehead <laughs> for about two seconds there. Yeah, so yeah. back to you. Yeah. Uh, look, for them, what we can bring with our capital, our capacity, our, our ability to think and try things and innovate beyond what a practice alone can do, like how do we apply technology, and AI is a buzzword everywhere, but how do we help them build an application that streams line their process even more and even better so they can get to more people? And I actually think it's quid pro quo. Um, what I love about Ben and Sean and that business, well, there's many th- aspects I love about it, but what, what I do genuinely love is how open they are because they're not just out to build a great business. The number of practices that they either service by doing cross-referrals, but just opening their door and letting other practices in to know how they do it and teach them how to do it better, that stuff's gold. And I've just had a, a thought, and and maybe, Neil, we can, we can flick to yourself. By bringing the AMP uh, advisor network um, into the new world, I would say that their experience with their life insurance over the last five years with Resolution Life has not probably been exactly what they hoped for. Um, I, I would say that there's probably a lot of quick wins in getting that right, a lot of, a lot of bringing them back in closer again, um, because from what I've, well, what I've heard, and I, I'm, I'm also a, a client of Resolution Life, I'm still on hold it's about since um, 17th of September 2021. Um, uh, just jokes, resolution life. You won't be listening to this anyway because you probably don't engage the industry. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, so that, that's, that's, you're going to have a whole heap of people that probably need to fall back in love with life insurance. Would you agree? Yeah, I think that's the whole sector, unfortunately. You know, life insurance advice for a lot of advisors just got too hard. Uh, the economics of the model doesn't make a lot of sense because you don't necessarily have certainty of completion. Uh, so for a lot of, advisory practices, unfortunately, they've um, they've abandoned it. And that leaves a lot of clients with big gaps in their, their financial needs being satisfied. But with uh, such a big number, and, and we spoke about speed dating, is like, I, I know this is early days, but have you not thought about, we can solve this by using not just that business Osbreaker's life, but those sorts of businesses Abs- absolutely. build the pie, yeah? I think um, we saw a yeah. significant, in the last number of years, significant decline in the amount of specialists that operated in the life insurance space. And these, this translates through the numbers right across the sector in terms of new business written in life. Um, so it's been harder for specialists to make it work. Uh, a lot of people that are part-time in life insurance, if you like, and focusing on investments, particularly retirement clients, uh, have opted out of that that solution. And you're right. I think the pathways to, to future success for clients around getting life insurance advice, appropriately so, is um, is you know greater ca- access to, to specialist capability. Us brokers uh, have that model, and and we certainly advocate for it in terms of satisfying insurance advice needs. Or uh, the second thing is improve the process. Right. Correct. You know, in I think there's a lot of role that that's where businesses like Entirety can play a role. They can assist in how the process can be done, such that people can can just focus on delivering more advice. And and how can we help people connected yeah. with that? How can we use our smarts collectively and, and firepower with someone like a Brett Wright at Lifebit who can who can 
um, help re reinvent the way we as a collective, our advisors can get hold of, it, of insurance advice and get their clients into it. Absolutely. And and look, a big part of the, the, the Fortnum lineage was a real focus on investments. Yeah. And I know that you've got a significant number of people in your in your organisation in the Fortnum side of it um, uh, went there because of investments, stay there because of investments. Um, you, you, your turnover is very, very low. And look, one of those, uh, one of the podcasts that we did uh, was was Mark Chant from from Avondale Wealth Management. Um, and from memory, uh, he made the journey from uh, from I think CBA or one of the private yeah, banks. CBA. Yep, yep. Um, and <laughs> I vividly remember he said it was the income that he was earning and he had to tell his wife that he's going to start a business and, and all the rest of it. And I've just got a little quote um, that sort of sums up um, Mark's journey at Avondale. I'm just going to love to play that now. But the real moment of awakening for me is in, when these private equity groups, when they did the deep, deep dive into my business, they really said that I'm a sole practitioner. It's a lot of key, key person risk. Um, I'm probably... Uh, like a very well remunerated, glorified employee, and you would take me out of the business, there is no business. So the valuation that I thought I, I would be looking at was, was actually not there. So that was the catalyst for me to really work hard on growing out my business over the last five years. When you did end up moving, um, you found yourself now um, in, in an organization, a licensee. Um, we'll come back to that in a, a later in depth of how the licensee works if you, but how did you end up picking? Like, cause you, you could have gone many places. A lot of people would have taken, you know, a well qualified, well credentialed, experienced person with existing clients. What were you looking in a business partner? We probably sat down with at least 15 different licensees at the time. This is back in 2019 where there were a plenty. And really, I think that their offering was very similar, but I was very particular in choosing a licensee because, frankly, I think license the, the traditional licensee services are dead, where they would just offer you the ability to work under a license and clip the ticket and offer no more than that. What I was really looking for is a licensee that would probably do three main things for me. One is to keep me safe, keep my team safe. Um, two, I, w- I was looking for a licensee that will help us to be more profitable than where we are today. And three, teach me how to be more efficient. Our, our staff get involved in dealing with all, all of our clients. So that's probably one of the selling points that I find that we have is that when clients come in to deal with Avondale Wealth, they're really dealing with all of us. So we want to create that experience for the clients where they walk into the office and our staff know them by name. They know how they like their coffee. They we, they, they know, we know their history. We know um, their health situation. We know their family situation. And for us, it's, it's, a, it's a family office, but it's, the aim is really to create exceptional experiences for the client as soon as they walk through the door. Yeah, look, and on top of that, Mark's just a, a, a charming person to, to be in the same room. Yeah, with great you. It's really, really nice, it's really nice. So um, we did speak a fair bit about life in insurance just now, so we're going to pivot uh, over to you, Neil, on, on the investment side because that was sort of you know, Mark's big thing was, was running those investments. Oh, he's got some other businesses as well, but hmm. I know that you've got a lot of your people uh, have uh, are really passionate about the investment piece. Yep. Um, I'd like to know why you think that he is. Some sort of question, and is it going to change with the new news of bringing such a large amount of advisors into your stable? Yeah, like we we have a we have a lot of focus on helping advisory businesses uh, with portfolio management, uh, and that's one of the things that we've done a lot of work with uh, with Mark's business Avondale on, and uh, and the philosophy of our business, but also a lot of advisory practices is how can they. Uh, get best of breed and get efficient on the way that they deliver uh, portfolios to their clients. It's important because we're an advice business, so we've got a high degree of flexibility around that. So we've built really strong capability around uh, resourcing portfolio construction and, and we've got lots of tools, whether they be MDAs or SMA structures to help implement that stuff. So, What about new people coming to the license? Because you can have a few of them. Yeah. So what would Jeff, like any assistance around change management, bring them in or- yeah, we we certainly do. So, I, I I don't really see 
that advisors these days want to run businesses that don't have some approach or philosophy around how they service their clients' investment needs. Uh, but it's challenging sometimes to to put those things in place, to monitor them, to have their right governance structure sitting over the top, and that's the stuff we help advisors with. And it, there's a process, uh, and it, it's change, some circumstances, uh, it's education in some others, but we work through that uh, methodically with, our, with, with the advice so they implement it in their business carefully. Uh, and then we help them understand how it goes ongoing, which, which makes a lot of sense, of course. So that's a big part of, of what I said before. We're, we're about enabling advisory businesses to do their job. And this is a key component of support for what they look to do. So we, as we continue to, to grow from an organizational perspective and we serve more financial planning practices, you know, we see that as a growing part of our service proposition delivery to, uh, to, to, to others as well. So. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's uh, it's only something that will continue for us. And b- before I get on to the, the next practice, I, I, w- I just wanted to ask, how do you get feedback from your advisors? Do you have like an advisory council? Yeah. How, is that going? I mean, obviously, it's going to be fleshed out because um, you know everything you've said's great and and building it, but you know how do you continually get that feedback? Well, you remember that Roxy it comes from the genesis of who uh, Fortnum is. It's it's owned. By advisors and management, and so it's a, it's we can only do this if we're doing it together. So it's an owner's mindset, right? That that's yeah. that's the fundamental, right? Yeah. We're, you've got a mobile phone, yet? Yeah? Uh, yep. Yeah. Uh, so do I. Uh, yeah. How do we get feedback? Well, twenty four seven, mate. Um, that's it, it. It's live conversations when you when you're close with people. Except like, oh. when Neil's camping. Yeah. Which is uh, uh, which is a smart move, mate. Yeah, there's a mental image just, uh, uh, of Neil and his boxes around a campfire that uh, I'll just tart torture everyone. We with, we but, can edit this. We're not going to. <laughs> but the um. Um. Uh. Yeah. Feedback, but but having infrastructure for clear yeah. feedback. So yeah, our philosophy is multi business, multi brand. So each license, Fortnum still exists yeah. under as a part of the entirety group. PFS still exists under the entirety group. Uh, the AMP networks, albeit whatever brand they, those advisors choose, will have their own networks. Each of those. Interesting. You should say that because you said whatever they choose. So, I mean, this is my personal opinion. Um. I imagine they might want to have a choice potentially, and that might be something that's on the table. I don't have to answer it, but yeah. that might be something. I was on more the table. specifically talking about um, uh, the branding question. Yeah, that's what I meant. That's what, that's also what I meant. Yeah. Maybe maybe going forward, they might want to have a choice. Some might want to. They might want to stay. They might want a, a, a fresh start, and that's going to be a really interesting sort of to, to sit as a, as someone watching the observation of that. Yeah, yeah, and 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 so long as you have dialogue, like my wife told me early that you know every every ongoing relationship is is based on a good communication, right? Um, don't know where she got that from, but um, but she's true. So so we have good infrastructure. Yes, we've all got a, each license and each community, each culture has its own advisor forum or council, yeah. or um, they've got um, uh, we do an annual survey uh, with an independent expert expert group that that does that for us. So yes. Completely anonymous, um, brutal honesty comes through on that, which is great. Um, but the most powerful feedback is just being there day to day and twenty four seven. They've got access to not only the smartest people, because I'm biased. I think we've got the best team in the business. Um, the people around us who whose hardest job is making Neil and I look good. But I tell you what, they are bloody smart people. But they're empowered to make decisions, and so they get direct access to decision makers, and that's that's where it really hits the road. And look, a part of ensemble is. We we can give you feedback. I mean, uh, they talk about you in podcasts. They talk about um, you guys online in forums and whatnot. And and part of the openness with with your group and 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 ensemble is the fact that that that'll be something that we can we can share increasingly, which will be very interesting. Better to know than not, right, Roxy? Absolutely, absolutely. And let's let's um let's move on to uh, the next practice, which is uh, it's Jake Roos from Bob Roos and Co. He's he's uh, he's a funny guy. We had a great chat and. Um, uh, he said that he, he came in to help his dad out and I sort of suggested his dad just threw him a bang because he didn't know what he was doing with himself. And if Jake, you're listening, you'll have a giggle with that. Um, great business down um, in, in the Shire, been there for a long time. Um, what's, what's their trick to get capacity? Because he did mention that they've just, the talent pool, although they are mainly recruiting from their own family members, uh, yeah. which was one thing. I, and I think I suggested that... Uh, uh, Ancestry.com was used more than <laughs> Seek.com um, in their recruiting strategy. Um, 
And jokes aside, I'm just going to give you a, a, a quote from 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 Jake uh, that sums up sort of a bit of an insight into their business. Can you hear all that? Yeah. So at the moment we've got three ARs, one PY. Yep. And, and the back office. Yeah. So we've got silos. So each AR's got um, basically an advisor associate and a support staff. That's all. Yep. Uh, and how many client groups do they look after? These are all kind of like checks and balances. Everyone in their head goes, oh, where where am I at compared to this business? Yeah, look, we, we're actually looking at our numbers at the moment. So um, we're redesigning. I was servicing too many. Um, so with the, without those silos, so it, we could handle that with the help of other ARs. But um, so we're, we're scaling back um, at the moment. The you know the targets around that one fifty each, mm-hmm. um, but. I think I, I see that changing in the future, which we'll, I know we'll get to. But so that's the rise and rise of advice associates, as we intimated off air. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. We, as I said before, we were counting to 2019 and had a had a hunch that it was going to be sold. The CBA were going to offload it, and um, so we started looking around what our options were. Um, Self license first. Uh, re- uh, repositioning ourselves with a licensee. This is an interesting one. Yeah, I'm very interested because. Uh, you're at that crossroads. Mm. You had the business scale to go self-licensed or not as well. Yeah, so we did the numbers on it. And at that time, the cost, the additional costs in resources far outweighed the benefit of staying under a licensee. Um, so we decided that we didn't want that headache and didn't want that um, additional work. And I'm glad we did at the time because there's been so much change and so much disruption to our industry with compliance for the last 15 years. So especially of recent times, no one knows what's happening and, you know, the, your planned legislative changes that gets us all excited. And then, it, you know, what it's, how it's written is completely different. So we basically decided that was an easier path at the time. And the biggest thing for us, um, what we were happy with and really, really wanted to make sure we could maintain for our clients is the quality of the research. Um, so Council research over the years had been good, um, well, exceptional. So that was a big part of our repositioning um, as well as normal other stuff. Um, but Count up until around that time had been quite, a, in, as its business values had been quite a, aligned to ours with that family approach. Um, so we were looking to rehome with someone like that. So um, AU became that that uh, number one uh, that we were going to go to. So we moved across to them. Um, and which Must now- be something in the water. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So which has obviously now become PFS under Fortnum's ownership. Um, so and that transition between uh, AU and uh, um, Fortnum's transfer was actually um, quite a smooth one where we really didn't notice much at all. So pretty happy with that. Um, and that's why we choose to maintain where we are now. So Yes, look, some great insights there. And, and one of the interesting um, facets is that when I was speaking with, with Jake, he, he's, he's, his father started the business and, and, and uh, a couple of Jake's kids are in it. So there's three generations yep. in, in that business. And, you know, uh, when we all started in planning in the, in the 90s, um, uh, it was very common to have a business with with uh, you know the, the children involved, and I feel like that's that's not as prevalent now. And, and I suppose, Matt, if I could ask you a question, what do you see as the the opportunity for a young person coming through a practice uh, like like Bob Bruce and Cohen? What are you doing as a licensee entirety to foster young people? Because we need that youthful mm. energy to make it work. Yeah, well. One of the things I love about Jake and his whole business is how passionate he is on this very subject. And in fact, yesterday, um, spent a few hours with Jake yesterday and we had dinner, uh, last night. Um, and one of those topics was exactly that. And so how does his business model, uh, attract, uh, which is a decent size, but a family business, right? Um, and how do you create a great experience for newcomers to come in and how do they get a clear sense of purpose so that they know what they're doing, but a career path? And that's often hard to do through through a relatively small business. So um, our innovation with with all of our practice with Jake is that how does he create roles within his business um, from PY year into associate and into 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 advisors? And one of the things we've learned over the last number of years, particularly let's focus just in one of those areas on PY candidates, is is the experience is pretty poor because the obligation is often left to the, the advisor as the supervisor, who is also a practice principal, also got clients. And the, the the candidate themselves is not getting the engagement or the training, and so they they tick some boxes, 
but they come out the end of it and either fail their exam or they get out and they're not profitable or productive because they actually don't know how to soft skill a client, yeah. how to engage a client, um, how to uh, they know a compliance checklist, but they they don't have it engaged. And some of our advisors are thinking, look, if a supervisor in our practice is doing it right, it's about two hours a week. It's a hundred hours at three hundred and fifty dollars average church out time. So Jake's probably spending thirty five grand of lost opportunity on a person who then leaves within six months because the experience isn't good and they haven't been engaged in that practice. And that's not just idiosyncratic to that practice. No, no. That's, well, I get that every He's week. an example. That's every Correct. So uh, we've spent a lot of time uh, understanding that over the last 12 months, six months in particular, uh, under the entirety group. And we've rebuilt an entire program for for our um, PYU candidates. So Awesome. So, so what does that – so you're going to – Shoulder some of the burden that currently the SME business owner oh, has to do. Is that right? Absolutely. And we reckon we'll, we'll take a half to two thirds of the time off the practice principal or the supervisor. So we've built a, a technology platform. Right. Uh, we've got in our first iteration of it over 51 videos that go from every part of the practice. So engaging clients, um, all the compliance stuff. So it's, it's self paced. But then we have in our group, a lady, her name's Tracy. She's wonderful. She was a practitioner and ran her own practice for 25 years. She's now our guru, PY mentor. So she mentors all of the, uh, all of the PY candidates for all of our practices. So, uh, Jake, in this instance, he'd only now have to spend less than half of that time. Um, he can focus with that candidate about the things that are important to them. Uh, and we integrate the things that have been missed in our industry forever, like, how do you soft skill? How do you sell? How do you engage? How do you get over conflict? How do you sell a price increase? We teach them really how to be an advisor, just not what the textbook says. And this, so 51 videos, so fantastic, by the way. Like that's, uh, um, you know, the, the concept of PY is, um, is, is wonderful on paper. It's inherently flawed operationally, right? Um, and that's got to do with the fact that um, even if you do a cracking job, um, uh, a small business owner might just lose that person to to someone else. Um, and uh, yeah, it's 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 just a tough road. And will this be something that you'll evolve through into the with with the new entrance into your your business? The oh, PY program? Yeah, absolutely. It's one of the things we'd love when um, when when our A and P cohort come over. Uh, oh, we think what we've built is pretty unique. And do you have any publicly available links? So if I'm not in your group currently, and, and and that what you've just said there is something like oh, hallelujah. Um, if there's any links, look, we, we we might we can always put that in 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 with the podcast. Um, if we've got anything or at least a a call to action, it'd be quite useful. Oh, sure, yeah. The more people know how to do this, well, the better. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And look, our final practice um, that uh, I interviewed um, in this little series was uh, Ian Rogers from Nesworth, and I'm I'm going to throw throw to yourself, Neil, because. They're a big business. Um, you know, they, if, if you go back and listen to the podcast, they disclose their turnover and speculating 15 or 20 million or somewhere in that vicinity. Yeah. Big business, um, looking to achieve that objective of, of servicing more, more Australians um, in that financial planning one and looking to really expand uh, where they're at. And very much is just the beginning for them from what Ian articulated. So um, I've got... Uh, I've got a little quote from um, from Ian about sort of where they are now post um, sort of absorbing the business. It'd be great to hear from him. Okay, just throwing over to you, Karen. The business had um, great bones, great DNA, and some really good principles around some of the things that we'd always struggled when we had funding for bigger businesses to implement stuff like um, basic stuff that really matters, like solid cash flow management, understanding those sort of things. It was doing it really, really well. So we saw an opportunity to build a a, a um, framework of all of the good things we'd seen. I, I've been absolutely blessed to work with hundreds and hundreds of businesses over the last 20 years. I've seen the good, bad, the indifferent, um, and taking all of those learnings into what was a great shell, knowing we need to do a lot of stuff um, around technology, people, um, at clarity around the business. But uh, we got enthused and um, we we got into it and uh, ended up, running the business, um, owning part of it, and that's been a big journey over the last five years. We've had a lot of change. It's been good. What do you think that you guys bring to the table on a regular basis to to attract not only people to work for you, BAU, but for other business owners to sell quite often their life's achievement and be part of your organisation? 
well, we've been really clear on our vision and everything that underpins that. We 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 were clear on that right from the start because um, I can get in front of you know we we have been growing, so we've had to employ a fair few people, and um, we want to employ the people that share this vision. So we're going to be able to articulate that. So it, it's interesting. Before we do anything, I will sit down and I I do get enthusiastic about what we're doing, what we're trying to do. I, I talk about the technology we're embracing, where we see ourselves in two years' time, because in the end, that's what people, they're, they're buying into a lot of stuff, but they're buying into our ability to realise that and what that looks like. I am the first to admit it'll be slightly different in three years from what we painted on. We can't control everything, but um, we're taking everyone on that journey. We want everyone to take that journey with us, and they need to understand that. So that's been the really big thing for us and I also get for some employees or, or or business owners looking to join us that's not always right but if we get that clear we can we can flush that out and um uh next you know we'll just sort of changing years to be a bit more punchy on and so who, who are you licensed with Bornham. Bornham, okay and they've got a new co coming up which is their name this is a quiz first book you've got to say it then it's got a lot of eyes in it so uh go for it Entirety, and I think I've got that right. You have. You've enunciated it correctly. So, so uh, yes, uh, we don't need to edit that out. So, um, and and I interview quite a few practices in in the Fortnum and and the previous. You know, that's a, now a combination of of of, of Australian unity, and and um, I believe that that story was also your story. Maybe give us a bit of an idea of what recently happened. So back in November, we were sailing along and in actual fact we'd done a, a, a big um, piece of strategy we'd assessed where we're at because we had bought a few businesses we confirmed that we originally thought well we might like a presence down the east coast because what we do we thought we did well and could take to other cities uh, we decided there was so much opportunity in southeast queensland we'd stick there and three weeks after we did that um, the opportunity came up to acquire the australian unity salary business and we had to move fairly quickly we had plans for a rebranding um sometime about now thankfully we've done a lot of the work because we had to rebrand quite quickly before uh the australian unity uh sale was executed so we took on the australian unity salary business obviously it came with a licensee pfs um, we had a very good strong relationship with fortnum and they took on the pfs license so we're, we've actually got staff that are dual licensed across them at the moment we don't envisage that'll happen forever because that provides some challenges, but that's what we've we've got at the moment. And um, yeah, that was one of the things. We're at a size now where we can move quickly, be flexible, and we took on took on that um, salaried business. They are yep. great to a point where you know we've got really good staff there. And they're that listening to you now, Ian. So, you, so <laughs> they're as good as the rest of the team. And look, Nestle is a, a relatively new name as well. Um, the the combination of of, of of uh, bringing together quite a few businesses. But, you know, we spoke um, off air about uh, they haven't always been with you and, and, and it'd be interesting maybe to, to get your take on, um, you know, why they chose you um, as, as, their, as their sort of running mate back in the day and what's next for them because their ambition's massive. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a really interesting story. They've, uh, they've been with us for a, a number of years now, but... They operated their business originally under their own license. Right. Uh, so the conversation started because, uh, as you've probably observed in their business model, they have a very, very proceduralized, disciplined approach to how they deliver advice to their clients. Henry Ford would be proud. He yeah. would be very proud. And what they found was that the license overlay, the distraction to be able to have to take care of doing that as well as their core purpose within their business, delivering that advice – it was just at odds. It was a distraction for them. Uh, when everything went wrong, they had to change systems and processes. They had to down tools on the advice and focus on on the things that were essential around the license. And they're all salaried, right? So, yeah, so yeah. when you down tools, running such a big payroll is expensive. Yeah, exactly. So, so they just found that it was an unnecessary, unnecessary distraction for what was their core business. So it made a lot of sense for them to think differently. So they could get more leverage by effectively using the things that we could help them with. So think about the amount of legislative change businesses have had to absorb, and that translates to change of process. We'll do all that for them so they don't have to do that themselves, and they can, again, stay focused on the delivery of advice. And as as they've then defined and refined those systems, uh, now they're scaling it. So 
whether it be more recently with the salary business of, of AU uh, PFS, uh, they're ambitiously growing. And they're, they've got a, a sort of a repeat formula around that that they put into their business model. And what we do is we just help them embed processes in that expansionary business. Every time they bring somebody new on or they buy an asset, we just help them streamline it. The technology stack that we apply through the business, uh, they've really got real leverage out of because they've then refined it to the types of advice they want to deliver to their clients. And and that makes you know business very, very efficient. And look, the whole languaging that you're both using today is how you can do something rather than telling them they can't do something. And not that other licensees are doing that, but that was that was the problem the last 10 years was there was a sort of a real blowback on on doing that. And that was fundamentally because you were working through those issues. Um, I have to say, though, uh, the Nestworth team, um, to quote Paul Barrett, who's been mentioned already, um, is a super firm. Uh, they're, they're attempting to move into that mid-tier um, style of, of business. And you, you have a few others like that, and certainly bringing on the, the, the AMP practices, there's quite a few very large and very successful businesses coming there. What role does entirety play in in sort of getting people together? Um, and how can I put this politely? You probably you might have you might have some smaller operators who are great operators potentially, um, maybe not the best at business. You might have people who are great at running a business but really need some talent. I'm not suggesting that we get Dexter from Perfect Match out and 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 send them away for a weekend. But you know, what role do you think, if any, entirety will play in the go forward of, of this yeah. sensible consolidation? Uh, here's the reality: we're a community of advisory practices, and uh, there's all shapes and sizes and business types that sit within that. Uh, our job's to be an enabler of those businesses in terms of what their core proposition is, which is to deliver advice. Uh, and because we bring the community together, yeah, there's opportunities for people to realize their ambition by sometimes doing things with somebody else in that same network. And it helps if you've got you know similar systems and processes to create real efficiency if you do sort of go that path. It's not mandated that you travel that path. Everyone's got their own journey. But for, for a number of businesses today, uh, consolidating themselves, getting larger, getting more automated, more system orientated uh, is is a way that they grow. And that's facilitated by the community, often in many circumstances. And you know what? Our community is uh, is getting a whole heap bigger. So more of those opportunities, I think, will, 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 will get fulfilled. But likewise, some firms will be happy to run their own journey and do their own uh, do their own thing in that sense. Uh, that's an option for them as well. And the most successful firms, when I look at my lens um, uh, through Ensemble, but also through my, my time at, at, at VBP, and um, the most successful firms have things like employee share schemes. They, uh, you know, you've got the whole team being involved to share in the game, etc. Uh, Matt, you intimated that that you know Fortnum's um, genesis was was very much that advisor owned. Um, here we are. Didn't prep for this question. Is that going to be something that the entirety will continue? Uh, it's probably early days to get the details, but but is that a philosophy that's going to continue? I think um, here's an observation in the industry is, is that uh, it's been going through you know a corporatization phase. You know, as we saw a lot of fragmentation, you're now seeing a period of consolidation. Businesses are coming together, uh, and as businesses get bigger, as they continue to grow, the challenges that they face into are different from when they're smaller. Uh, and where do they go? They're, they're, they're running small to medium businesses and they're looking around for support and help to take that journey. Well, we got a couple of things on our side. One, we've got plenty of others that have tracked that path before them. So that's fantastic because they can interact with those businesses. Uh, and that's real time feedback, you know, real time assistance. It's incredibly valuable. The second thing we've got is uh, know how and expertise to help them go there. So we put those two things together. And it's a pretty powerful combination for businesses to get further progressed around the things that they're doing than they might be able to do by themselves. And and that's uh, that's really why when we landed on the name for entirety, it means complete. 
Well, it didn't mean you take the entire industry, though. Like, let's be frank. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, I've been I've been waiting waiting to throw yeah. that joke in, but uh, I like it though. You like it? Uh, yeah, you can use that one. Yeah. No one listens to this podcast anyway. They won't. They won't even realize the nice <laughs> genesis of a good gag. There you go. There you go. There you go. Well, on that, um, uh, I really enjoyed the the time with with yourself, Matt, and yourself, Neil. Um, I really appreciate the availing yourself. I know that. Um, there were, were there was a lot of a lot of work goes into making a deal look simple, um, and you've only just brought together the other two businesses. Um, and really, the best way in which you can judge a license is by their practices. And for those listening, if any of those practices, they're all available. If you haven't listened to them, they're all cracking practices. Um, probably parts of the. Uh, quotes that we didn't put was what they talk about their licensee. But if you want to get some validation and some cross-reference, jump back there. That's what this podcast is all about. It's about you can't give good advice unless you've got good advisors. And advisors can't do it unless they've got their whole engine room. And licensee and licensee services mm. is the important part. So thank you, Matt. And thank you, Neil, for being on the engine room. Thank, thank you, Roxy. It's great. Cheers, mate.